Välkomna till Uppsala universitets forskarsoffa. Vi sänder ifrån Almedalen, Gotland. Och jag heter Stig Björn Ljunggren, statsvetare och ska tillsammans med professor Kevin Anderson diskutera klimatfrågan. Och den text som finns om det här samtalet säger ungefär så här. Genom Parisavtalet har Sverige och andra länder lovat att begränsa den globala uppvärmningen till under två grader. Kommer det att lyckas? Vilket ansvar vilar på politiker och oss alla? Det finns en bred enhet om att den ökade temperaturen i vår atmosfär i avsevärd grad beror på mänsklig påverkan. Varmare klimat medför risk för översvämningar, torka miljökatastrofer och klimatmigration. Världens länder har ett stort ansvar för att agera för att motverka denna utveckling. Sverige och andra länder har i Parisavtalet lovat att begränsa den globala uppvärmningen till, va, till väl under två grader. Men vad betyder det? Vilket ansvar vilar på politiker, företag och civilsamhället och på oss själva? Är det möjligt att leva, upp, leva både modernt och bekvämt och klimatsmart? Vad står på spel? Eh, Well, Kevin, uh, did you understand what I said? Uh, no, I didn't, unfortunately. I'm sorry, I only speak uh, English so far. So yeah, a few words of Swedish. Tell me, you're, you're a professor uh, and your name is Anderson. Uh, so does that mean you're uh, an ancestor of the Vikings or...? Well, my, my family are actually Scottish. So the, yeah, many, many years ago, the Vikings did actually visit Scotland um, as tourists, I think. Um, And so there probably is some link back to um, back to Scandinavia. Hmm. Um, But tell me about yourself. You know, sh sh short introduction. Who are you? Well, um, I'm Kevin Anderson. I'm a professor at Uppsala University, but also at Manchester University in the UK. And I am, I am actually originally an engineer. And I should say that I have a, a background working in the oil and gas industry. So I used to design and build offshore oil gas platforms. So I worked on that side for a lot of years. I also worked in the Merchant Navy as a trained uh, marine engineer. So my background was mostly engineering, but I was increasingly getting concerned about climate change and environmental issues. And so I went back to university to study those back in the 1990s now, and eventually um, became a full-time academic um, in the late 1990s. And, and now, I, now I'm here based in Uppsala. Okay, then the first question I want to ask you, you know, could you make a short summary of, of you know, uh, uh, a short summary about climate change, you know, what's at stake and Paris, Paris Agreement and so on. What, what, what are we actually discussing? Well, on a day-to-day -day basis, we, none of us live in climate, we live in the weather. And when we talk about climate change, what we're talking about is the change in the weather over longer periods of time. It might be over a decade, over two decades, out to 100 years or so. And what we're talking about in terms of climate change is change that we, as humans, have brought about knowingly in the last 25 to 30 years now, mostly from burning fossil fuels, from burning hydrocarbons. And we've been putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We have been knowingly changing the makeup of the atmosphere and we know for certain that that is changing the weather today and the climate for the long term. And on a lovely day in Visby, it's not, it doesn't feel like a, a major concern, but people today will be dying because of climate change in some of the more vulnerable parts of the Southern Hemisphere particularly. I mean, from the Swedish per perspective, you know, I come from the north of Sweden, uh, and there's a talk about Norrland, the, the, the north of Sweden becoming like Tuscany. Yes, yeah. Uh, and, and it, You know, I hate snow, uh, so I, 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 I can understand. It, it, that, that sounds interesting, uh, you know. But, but what you're saying is that the situation might be kind of better in Sweden, but it will be uh, worse, much worse, in other places. Yes, and it will only be temporarily better in Sweden, because what we'll also see is huge levels of migration. And we've already seen what some small levels of migration have done to the structures of the EU over the last you know, over the last three or four years. So we were seeing huge amounts of migration all around the world as people move from places that are climatically not appropriate for them to live anymore, and they'll be pushing into their neighboring countries, their neighboring regions. And these people will, of course, gradually move up towards, towards your Tuscany in the north of Sweden. So you'll be seeing lots more Europeans move north. You'll be seeing lots more Africans from North Africa move into Europe. 
So we're going to see a migration to pe of, of people, as we have, of course, historically, um, to areas that are more appropriate for living. So Sweden may see a very significant increase in population as people move here. So uh, w what we're actually saying is that, you know, th th how, how can we, uh, if we want to discuss climate change, we could look at the statistics. And we can also look at what are people actually doing. Uh, and, and then yeah. we, we will see that there's, uh, the statistics corresponds with what people are doing. People are moving. Yes, yeah. And b we also have to look his historically here. I mean, there are some interesting parallels throughout history of where people have migrated because of, the cli because of climate change. Now, that climate change has not been brought about through, um, through burning fossil fuels. It's been brought about through changes in river patterns and, migration and um, um, irrigation of crops and things like this. We've seen that we saw this in the Nile many hundreds of years ago now. Nile. In the Nile many, yeah. many years ago now. Yeah. So we've seen ma major civilizations have had to move with all of the chaos that involves because of localized climate change. Not at a global level, this has been localized. What we are now causing is globalized climate change. And we're already seeing some migration from that. We also know that although the Syrian crisis clearly was not caused by climate change, but the, the stresses and the tensions in those communities were exacerbated, were made worse by the significant drought that they saw. So the big problems with food um, and water in those areas just made stresses that already existed actually worse. So we're seeing the early stages of this already play out within Europe, as well, of course, in as other parts of the world. So, so what you're actually saying now is that, you know, we have, uh, we have had during history climate change, but they have not been uh, caused by human action. And, and climate change has also changed this, this, the uh, construction of, 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 of uh, civilizations. It, it has indeed, yes. Um, I mean, climate change has always happened, whether we were on the planet or we're not on the planet. But what we are seeing now is the rate of climate change is going up incredibly fast. And it's also worth bearing in mind that human civilization, which has been, well, as humans, have been on the planet for about 300,000 years. And as as well-organized communities, we've only ever lived through relatively stable climates, so within one degree of where we are today. So humans have evolved and, th and thrived and done well with a very stable climate. And what we are absolutely certainly not going to have in the future is a stable climate. So, so what you're actually saying now is that the reason why we are sitting here, we have a quite nice time, uh, good wealth and so on, that's uh, caused because of a uh, long period of stable climate. It, it is indeed, yes. And historically, that's been quite unusual. If you look across the, the history of the planet, that has been quite an unusual period. Um, and of course, ge geologically, it's been a short period. We, we would like to extend that. Unfortunately, because we're burning fossil fuels, we are changing our climate that we have uh, grown up with, with as, a, as a civilization. So th there is a saying that, you know, follow the money and you will see, you know, what, what kind of... of, of forces are actually uh, uh, happening. Uh, can we see that investments are, are uh, uh, sh changing because of the, the climate? You can s certainly on two, two levels. You can see investments in terms of learning to live with a changed climate. So quite simple examples are um, champagne growers growing, buying up land in the south of the UK because they think that would be a more appropriate area for growing the appropriate types of grapes. We see changes in, in coffee plantations. So we see money moving, particularly with these uh, commodities that are related to agriculture, where there's a lot of money to be made. People are looking ahead to see, well, where will we be? Where's the next best place for us to be, to be pursuing this sort of activity? Um, so so, so w if we see uh, wine producers starting to buy land in north of Sweden, we will know that Tuscany is, is around the corner. Yes, there may be a few years before they few move to years, north yeah, of okay. Sweden. Yeah. 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 Uh, but and and uh, you also said there were two, two ways of, of following the money. Well, the, the other way, of course, is what we see is, actually we've seen this already, is that the, some of the energy companies actually recognize that climate change is very serious and they're putting a lot of money into renewable energy. So we see that side of things as well. We are seeing um, investors saying, well, actually, perhaps the fossil fuel route is not the right route to go. Perhaps we should be investing in renewables. And we're seeing that across the world, and not just in the West, but you know, significantly in places like China, who are actually moving away from coal um, as, as we speak. Yeah, I, I met the, this guy from the, this Saab company, or whatever the name is now, and they are producing electric cars in China. So seven million a year or yes, uh, yeah. in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So, but also, I guess, you, uh, one reason why s some investors are trying to, to uh, f don't like the, the Par Paris Agreement is because they, uh, it uh, makes it more difficult for profits in the, in the short run. 
Well, it does if you're stuck. They, uh, not in, they would want to invest more than in, 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 uh, in um, trying to prevent the, uh, these Paris agreements. Well, certainly lots of people in the, in the oil and gas industry would, would, you know, are doing exactly that. Um, so these people are trying to fight against the obvious tide of history, though. I mean, they, they, they are the, they're today's dinosaurs, and, and most of the more progressive end of the investment community is fully aware that that's not the place that you'll make medium to long-term um, uh, money. So you know, we generally find that in investments, it's much harder to get good returns from the hydrocarbon sector now than it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. So there's already quite a shift, even amongst those people who are very reluctant to move away from hydrocarbons to alternatives. So uh, we could say we have a situation. So what should we do about it? I mean, uh, who is responsible for the future? Uh, the leaders, of course, are responsible. And who are the leaders? We have to look at the prime minister, uh, even if he doesn't come here to Almadal. Uh, yeah. Some of his ministers come. Uh, we have, of course, the Wallenberg family, you know, the big, big finance uh, mm. family. Uh, and we have the, or the Swedish king and all the leaders. Are, are they, uh, you know, are they are the, the, the um, uh, force we should look for to, to have a change or what else? No, they're not the force we should look for in isolation. They are important players. But I think it is always easy to, to think that leaders are other people. And actually, we need to look to ourselves here for leadership, particularly amongst uh, the community, communities that are, um, attend events like this, that we are the people that are influential. We are the ones from our children who can change how their parents think about climate change issues because they've learned something from their teachers. Um, uh, well, well, that happens to most of us that are you know, above 50 years. Uh, the children come home and tell yeah. pop, but that, that you shouldn't do that. You yes, shouldn't yeah. throw the batteries there. You, you know, why do you hate the future? You know, things like that. Uh, so so uh, even the children could be leaders. Yeah, the children can be leaders because they can change their parents, and the parents then can change their schools, but also students in universities and lecturers and people working in their, wherever they work, in their, in their work environments, wherever they pursue their hobbies and their sports. We have all a scope to demonstrate leadership locally. So we need to, the old cliche, we need to think globally, but actually act locally. And we all have potential to bring about significant change. And ultimately, leaders like prime ministers never bring about change in isolation. They bring about change because they've seen really good examples demonstrated elsewhere. And without those examples, they won't be able to drive um, national and global change. So it's therefore incumbent on people like us who do engage in a sort of local political environment within our companies, within our organizations, to drive the change that we need to see. Um, and that, those, exa those examples will then be multiplied up by the policymakers to, to hopefully see Sweden move in the right direction, and then the EU, and then hopefully globally. So, so w w what can we do? The people are sitting here, they are wondering, you know, they don't want a catastrophe uh, for themselves, and uh, 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 definitely not for the children. Uh, what, what, what can we do then? Well, I, let's be clear. I, I'm not going to sweeten the pill. I'm not going to make this a, a, a nice, easy message. There are many things we can do, but actually for, for people probably like quite a few of us here, it's becoming quite challenging because we are the ones who are responsible for most of the problem. 50% of global emissions of carbon dioxide come from just 10% of the global population. So 50%? 50%. Half of all global emissions come yeah. from just 10% of the global okay. population. And I would have a guess that virtually everyone, with a few exceptions, but virtually everyone in Visby over the Almadalen week will be in that 10% group. So that particular group, people like us, who would like to think we live normal lives, but of course do not, we are the very the, uh, at a global level, we are incredibly wealthy. We live incredibly rich material lives, incredibly rich energy lives. We are the ones that are going to have to demonstrate significant changes of how you can live a good quality of life with much less energy consumption and in probably actually much less overall consumption. So we have to look at our lives and say, what is it we need to do and change? And if we think that's difficult, I would suggest then, if we have children, when you're having breakfast with your children, it's their future we're talking about. So it's our own children's future. And of course, it's the children and the adults today in the poorer parts of the world who are typically non-white, have not caused the problem, who live a long way from here, who are already suffering the consequences of how we choose to live our lives today in Visby. So uh, what do you think we have done? Uh, uh, well, everybody's, everybody's here in Almedalen. What is, is the major mistake we made? Was that taking the flight? 
<laughs> well, certainly taking a flight would be a mistake, particularly somewhere like here when there are alternative, quite clear alternatives. Um, so yes, they're the things we need to look at. We need to look at our lives and then say, which, where were our major emissions? Where are our major um, causes of climate change coming from? And as a, at an individual level, but even at an institutional level, within something like a university, for instance, flying would be one of, probably one of our major sources of emissions. But in addition to that, people who fly regularly would generally have reasonably large cars. I mean, Volvos are not efficient cars. So Sweden needs to do something about its car market. So you know, probably have reasonably large cars. They'll live in quite large houses. They'll consume a lot of material goods in those houses. A lot of Swedish people um, have second homes. Quite a few of them I've discussed with have, have third homes. So we think that there are many people in the planet who, on the planet who do not have any home, and yet there are lots of people in Sweden with two and three homes. Those homes have other facilities, have other material goods. We drive there in our large cars during nice times of the year. Then when it's too cold in Sweden, we fly to Spain or to Thailand for a holiday. So, and we think this is normal. This is it's not normal. normal. Is it normal? No, yeah. it's not. Most people uh, should never we make fly. a short survey. How many of you didn't take the flight coming here? Oh, okay, and how many doesn't have a second home? So must you go. Oh, there are quite a lot of that. Yeah. Oh, but still, the rest may be... I, 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 yeah. yeah, so, but we, I mean, it's not that we necessarily want to blame people because we've, uh, we've only... Well, we've had a quarter of a century now of understanding climate change very well. Nevertheless, you know, we've lock, we're lock, society has been sort of locked into how it's done things in the past, and it needs to now move away quite rapidly from that. So now we know that these problems exist. We need to find new ways of trying to live good quality lives. And there are plenty of good examples, both technically, socially, economically, institutionally, about what we can do to respond to climate change. Um, but at the moment, we seem to lack the courage to make those difficult choices in the early days, in other words, today. But, but, but what you're actually saying is that we, what we think is normal, like uh, this day in mm. Almendal, is quite normal. Yeah. <laughs> it's not normal. We're, no, we're, we're no, uh, not, no. abnormal. Yeah, we, we are abnormal. I mean, we, we often say, well, everyone flies, is a good example. But, you know, probably no more than 5% of the global population flies. You know, everyone drives. Well, actually, a large proportion of people in the UK don't have access to a car. So even in our own doorsteps, we see that what we think is normal is not normal behavior. Um, and we have to remind ourselves of that almost on a daily basis. Um, and it is that normal paid behavior by people like us, you know, the wealthier in society, is that normal behavior that is actually um, destroying our children's prospects in the future. But, but, but you know, uh, most of us, we would keep on living our, this abnormal life. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the, uh, w w what I would like to say then is, well, uh, we'll keep on for a while because technology will help us, you know, to keep on living even better without doing these emissions. Well, as an engineer, I wish I, wish I could <laughs> agree with you there. Technology is a really important part of how we're going to respond to climate change but it will not deliver the changes rapidly enough. And often, of course, when we see technologies coming along, they, they bring with them lots of other problems or lots of other environmental concerns. So technology, you know, whether it's wind power, whether it's solar power, these sorts of options are available. We can have electric cars, we can use public transport, we can cycle more, we can have better quality clothes when it's raining and cold, we can stay warm on our bikes. So there are all sorts of technologies Across the, across the board that can help us respond to climate change. But that will not be possible in the time frame we have to get emissions down so that we're not going to lock our children's future into significant levels of climate change. And therefore, ultimately, it becomes a partnership between technology, policy, social change, adjustments to how we see our economy, and ultimately to what, how we see a good quality of life. What is a good quality of life? So Technology can help, but yeah. it will not solve the problems. So, so what is the time frame? I mean, uh, how serious is it? And, you know, how, how, how many years do we have to, to, uh, uh, to wait before the catastrophe is here? Or is it already here? Well, if you're poor and black, it's already here. I mean, yeah. to be yeah. blunt about it, yeah. lots of people are already suffering from climate change today. And of course, that has extended to things like um, Sandy the, in, in New York when we saw the storm there. Now, that wasn't caused by climate change, but the 20 centimeters of sea level rise that we have knowingly caused from climate change made that the 